And I talk a lot of, I talk a lot about that. Um, and so what we're going to focus on today is basically we're going to talk about kind of like working with adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And what we know about adult survivors with child sexual abuse is that they don't um, always need the same um, services that um, adult survivors of sexual assault need. Um, because a lot of times the stuff that they have been um, dealing with happened years ago, um, but now they are actually either dealing with it or it got re they got triggered again for some reason and are either coming back through because they need help um, stabilizing themselves or coming for the first time talking about it um, for an effort towards healing. So, um, so I kind of, I wanted to start um, by asking, and you can either unmute or you can enter into the chat. Um, but also if you could, so Lauren Schwartz started us off by saying good afternoon and that she's a director of sexual assault services that interact. So um, I wonder if you, if the rest of you can also um, enter your, what, where you're from, like what's your role at your organization and what organization are you from? So you can either unmute and, um, and let me know, like turn, and it's up to you whether you turn your camera on or not, but you can unmute and tell me, or you can enter it into the chat. I'm good either way. Cool. So Janelle, you're from Sp Safe Space Inc. and you're a domestic violence sexual assault advocate. So um, and Danielle is direct services coordinator at Rape Crisis in Robeson County. Awesome. This is really really helpful. All right. And Connor, um, currently interning on the sexual assault team at Interact. Oh, awesome. You're a social work student at UNC pursuing your MSW. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so um, we have a small group today, which is really awesome. So I have some things for us to talk about, but I also kind of want to open it up since we have such a small group. If you have other questions that you want answered, um, yeah, just let me know and, and we'll go there with you. Okay, so the first question I have, and this might be a little harder for you, Connor, but, um, but let's see how it goes. First question I have for you all are what advocacy skills do you normally use? Like kind of everyday advocacy skills do you use? So I'll give you an example um, and you can enter this into the chat. Um, Oh, what? Okay, thanks, Leah. <laughs> so Leah's entering the question into the chat. So, uh, so one example of an advocacy skill that you probably use pretty much all the time is listening, and probably active listening. Um, but what else? So you can always you can go ahead and enter that, or and also kind of what else? Like, do you do safety planning? with survivors on a regular basis? Um, are you leaning into the domestic violence side of things a little bit more? So you might be working with people around protection orders or are you leaning more into the sexual assault area and working with people who are working with law enforcement or with prosecution? So just kind of want to get an idea of what skills you use on a pretty regular basis.
Okay, awesome. Education, um, resources and referrals, 50-C and 50-B. And I don't know what that means, Leah. Do you know what it means, the 50-C and B? Yeah, so in North Carolina, our protective orders are, um, oh. the 50-B is for like a dating partner, whereas the 50-C is more like a no contact. Okay, awesome. Oh, and Connor, awesome that you're, um, that you're, entering stuff in as well. This is great. Empathy, compassion, safety planning, education on sexual assault and trauma resources, connection to mental health resources. Awesome. That's, these are awesome. So, um, all right. Oh, and self-care. Um, so Danielle, just a question here on self-care. Self-care that the um, survivor learns to take care of themselves, like when triggered, kind of like grounding, and that kind of stuff or self-care uh, for both them and you. Awesome. Okay, perfect. All right, these are good. Okay, so, um, so what I wanna do is um, I'm gonna pop up my PowerPoint because it's guiding my discussion with you. And, um, and then I'll still be checking the chat, but um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And I can keep an eye on the chat for you, Olga, if you would like. Oh, awesome. That would be great. Yes. All right. So let me turn this on. I think it'll be a little easier. I just didn't want to lose sight of you guys, but this is great. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, community. And, and the reason we're going to talk about building community and whys and hows of building community is because it really helps survivors cope with the violence that they've experienced. And it, we are finding that it's a huge part of healing for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And a lot of you, well, I'm going to say, Connor, I feel like you're on that um, because of the skills and stuff that, that you're identifying that you use on a regular basis. Um, this is not going to be a stretch for you um, and, and, and probably not a stretch for any of you, um, especially if you're providing education or you're doing resources and referrals, because this is this is going to be a little bit similar to that. So but so first, we're going to kind of explore coping and healing for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And then we're going to examine kind of why creating community helps. Um, and then we're going to explore how you can support adult survivors of uh, child sexual abuse to heal. So the first question I asked you was, what are some advocacy skills you regularly use? Um, and like, I, and so the ones that you all have offered are really helpful. Some of the ones that I was thinking about as well was like the listening. And it's kind of that active listening. Um, and actually, I think Connor expressed it the best with empathy, compassion. So it's that kind of um, listening where you're right there with the survivor and, um, and expressing and a, a sense of connection through empathy and compassion. So helping people access systems, which um, Janelle has talked about through resources and referrals, and also through the protection orders. Those, that would be accessing systems through the court. Um, connecting survivors to services. Again, other people have mentioned this, either mental health services or court services or, or, or housing services, I imagine as well, right? And then, um, another thing that I think you all do, and I'd be curious if you would put this in the chat, if you do, is working with partners and, and training partners to help survivors um, as they work with them. So meaning um, multidisciplinary partners that you're part of uh, multidisciplinary teams and part of your role with those uh, partners in, in the law enforcement, prosecution, courts, um, and any other partners, medical um, and mental health is also making sure that they know 
what they need in order to work better with survivors of sexual assault. Um, hi, Anna. Thanks so much for joining our chat. You're with a safe home. Um, awesome. So, um, so just curious, do folks also do training or education of multidisciplinary partners? And if you do, just uh, put yes in the chat. And if you don't, just put no in the chat. Okay, so Janelle, no, but uh, Lauren, yes, we touch on this in cadet training, awesome. Danielle, yes, Anna, yes, awesome. Okay, and, um, and then we talked a little bit about safety planning. Some of you do safety planning and others of you, I'm assuming uh, don't need to do that in the work that you're doing right now. Okay, so I wanna shift a little bit um, away from kind of the advocacy skills that you use. And I'm gonna go back to something that uh, Danielle brought up, which was around self-care, um, self-care for them and also for you. So some of the skills that you use around self-care. So I wanna, I wanna explore this a little bit. So the question I have for you is, what helps you when you're having a hard time? Um, and it can be a hard time uh, about anything. It could be work-related or non-work-related. It could be if you're a survivor or you're not a survivor. Okay, so Danielle Music, you know, me too, totally. Um, I love listening to music. It helps to center me. Good food, <laughs> totally there, right there with you on good food, um, especially good food if I don't have to cook it. I'm not curious if anybody else. Um, Connor working out, spending time with loved ones, awesome. Um, these are really helpful. Other folks, so other things that I do. Okay, so thanks Leah, exercising, watching my favorite shows. That was exactly what I was gonna say. One of the other things that I do is I really love to, um, to watch TV or to watch movies. It allows me uh, an opportunity to shut my brain off and to escape, um, which I'm finding I need to do more and more these days. Um, dogs. Okay, I hope I'm saying your name right, Janelle. I hope it's Janelle, or if it's not, if somebody could correct me, that'd be great. You're um, saying it right. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks, Leah. Okay. Dogs is awesome. Play with my cats. Love that. Anna exercising, being outside, cooking. Okay. I love all of that. I'm not a big cook, but I love good food. <laughs> um, yeah. And thanks, Janelle, for letting me know. Lauren, going on a walk, uh, clean and listen to podcasts. Okay. So I totally get that, Lauren, the clean piece I really, really get. For me, it is. Um, it helps me to feel like things are under control. It helps to kind of calm me down. It helps me to address stuff around anxiety when I clean. And then, you know, it feels. It kind of distracts me, and it feels good when everything's clean. Um, I'm curious what podcasts you listen to. Um, my partner likes to listen to. Um, um, true crime podcasts, <laughs> which sometimes doesn't take me uh, away from work. Um, so yeah, okay, so Lauren, yes, exactly. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so Lauren, is what kind of podcast do you listen to? And then Connor, walking your dog. So what kind of dog do you have, Connor? Um, oh yeah, okay, so Lauren, true crime. <laughs> okay, so yeah, they're riveting. Um, and at the same time, they're hard. <laughs> so the one I'm listening to right now, I'm not sure if anybody else is listening to it, is, um, is the dropout and bad blood that talks about Elizabeth Holmes um, and Theranos. I'm fascinated by that. And I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, so yeah, L Lauren says, yes, that was so good. Um, so 
And then Connor has a great Pyrenees and then another that is a total mix of breeds. Um, and then Anna also loves true crime. So let me just take a second to kind of connect the Theranos one. I'm not sure if anybody else has this issue, but it reminds me. So I grew up in a home where I was, I was sexually abused and my father was a lot like Elizabeth Holmes in the sense that he was a constant, constant, constant liar and lied about just the most trivial things. And I never really got that. Like I couldn't figure out what, what that was about. So I'm fascinated by Elizabeth Holmes and how she is really a pathological liar. And um, so, so anyway, so, uh, and I imagine that there's some aspects of her that shows up in the people that um, have abused the survivors that you work with, because there is an entitlement there, there is a, a, a bully um, and a liar. Um, and for some reason, that doesn't trigger me, um, but, and I'm totally fascinated by it. Um, so, that, okay, so I love this and I love um, the great Pyrenees are such great dogs. They're just such great dogs. They're beautiful, big dogs. So I have um, a Borzoi mix, if anybody knows what that looks like. Um, they look a little bit like Russian wolfhounds. And then I think Leah, you just got a new dog. Um, so I think you should put the type of dog, you should let us know what kind of dog you have. I did. She is a, we think she's a pit bull lab mix. She's a, um, she's a rescue. So we're not hundred percent sure, but she's actually been really, we have some gas logs. We have a fireplace and she's really into that. So she's sitting in front of the fireplace right now. I'm very jealous. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so, and we also have a big black lab who has, um, he's like the trainer's dog, because my partner is a dog trainer, and he has um, fear and aggression and separation anxiety. That's what I mean by he's a trainer's dog. He has a lot of needs. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you so much for, um, um, oh, so Janelle has uh, two pit lab mixes. They're such great dogs. And Anna has a big black lab as well. Um, they're really, I, I want to say, let me just say, pit bulls are the sweetest dogs on the planet. Um, they really are motivated to please their owners. So super easy to train, really cuddly, lovable dogs. Um, we don't have any. Um, and uh, so many, many trainers have pit bulls because they have such a bad name that owners will end up getting rid of their pit bulls with any, when they have any issues. So the trainers will usually take them. Um, okay. So I want to allow, like, okay, so we have a really good list of the kinds of things that you do that help you um, when you're having a hard time. I'm going to add, I mean, I've been talking about all this, so I'm also right there with all of you. Exercise really helps me. Music really helps me, my dogs and my cat. Um, I mostly talk about the dogs, but my cat is really awesome. Um, and uh, I try to shut my brain off by listening to podcasts or watching um, television shows. Um, so all of these things are really, really helpful. Um, and, and so I want to kind of explore a little bit about, so this is my cat, Oscar. He, um, he loves that little, little cat toy that he has in his paws. Um, so I have some of our animals in, in these um, because these are, these are some of the things that help me. Um, so why do you think it helps? Like, why are these things helping you all? Um, yeah, thanks, Lauren. <laughs> you know, by the way, if you all have, um, you can upload pictures of your animals in the chat so feel free to do that because that's always fun or you can turn um turn your camera on and show us your pets 
um, whatever works for you, this is a really flexible discussion today. <laughs> um, so, so in the chat, uh, let me know why do you think these things help you when you're having a hard time? And I'm just going to say, Connor, you should have lots of ideas about this being a, um, an MS, you know, working your way to an MSW. <laughs> Not to put any pressure on you. But what is it that animals are great because they can tune into our emotions and know when you need a little comfort? That's exactly right. They're awesome. Um, it's relaxing. It's grounding. Unconditional love from pets. Yep. They are comforting and help ground us. That's exactly right. Pets are really, really good at that. In fact, one of the recommendations in doing trauma-informed work is having emotional support animals for people, um, especially in court or as they're preparing for court or in your programs, because they help people stay grounded. Um, so let's see, they're comforting and help us ground us. It gives us a break from what we are stressing about. Danielle, that is exactly right. It gives you a break. It gets you out of your head. Um, so TV or podcasts or music can change the chemistry in your brain by shutting, it, shutting off those you know, anxiety thoughts or the stressful thoughts, any of those. Um, going um, for a walk or a hike or a bike ride changes your um, changes where you are, and um, and that also changes the chemistry in your brain, and that relieves depression and anxiety. Just changing, just getting up and walking out the door and noticing the weather outside, uh, taking a walk. That is incredibly helpful for shifting anxiety and depression. It doesn't lift it completely, but it's a, it's a part of strategies to help people cope with them. Um, and I might have lost track of where I was. Let's see. Uh, gives us a break from what we're stressing about. That's where I was. They serve as distractions or ways to escape whatever is going on, sources of happiness. Exactly. Um, for me, they are also giving me a sense of purpose on those days. I don't want to get out of bed. That's exactly right. Because somebody else needs you to, right? So my dog needs to eat. They need to go on a walk. My cat is sitting on my head, you know, whatever. Um, and it, it's, it's really refreshing and because it, it takes you out of just what you're thinking about and it's a it's an animal that loves you like someone mentioned the unconditional love so it makes you feel good about it um i'm sure it releases serotonin and oxytocin hormones um, that make us feel connected and happy yes and you know who, you know what the studies show are really good for that is puppies um puppies release oxy, like working with puppies seeing puppies releases oxytocin and really helps with your uh, and the only reason I know this is because my partner is a dog trainer and last year during the pandemic the winter was really tough and um, she dog puppies need to be socialized within a certain period of time otherwise they can develop fear um, and anxiety so because we couldn't have people inside, I was helping her on Sundays with all her puppy socials. So it was me and my partner and a bunch of puppies. And I got to tell you, it was amazing. It made me like want to become a dog trainer. Um, so it was really amazing. So if you ever are really struggling and you need a break, um, going to the Humane Society, going to a shelter or doing um, fostering for a rescue group is a really great idea to just kind of help change the, the brain chemistry, what you've got going on. Um, let's see, working out has been a big one for me as it gets me out of my head. 
uh, when a lot is going on and it's also empowering. I totally agree with you, Connor. And what I find is that it makes me feel, it's exactly what you said, it's that empowering piece. It makes me feel really capable. Um, and then it also gets out a lot of um, feelings and, um, and emotions that sometimes get stuck when, when you're not um, being more active. So these are really, really awesome. So, um, so I want to kind of now shift this a little. And, and there's, a, there's a reason why I really want to kind of get into these things. All of these things help to manage um, uh, depression. It helps to manage anxiety. It helps people center themselves um, when they're having a hard time, get out of their heads. Um, and so, the, so this is my favorite dog. He's the Borzoi mix. So I don't know if you can tell from this, but he has a, actually a long nose. So a lot of people look at him and think he's a border collie, but what they don't see is that he has a collie type nose. So it's longer. He's very, very furry and he's tall. He has really long legs. So this is Griffin. He is my favorite dog ever. And I have my door closed with no dogs in here because the black lab does not like it when I talk about Griffin in these terms. Um, so if you think about all the things that help you and we have a sense of why those things are helpful, let's talk about um, what can you do to help survivors create these kinds of experiences themselves? Um, so, so for example, I talked about um, one of the things that you can do, one of the things I figured out last year um, when it was, nobody was traveling, the pandemic was hard. It was like right around the insurrection. I mean, it was really bleak last winter. And um, I would spend Sundays with my partner and like 10 puppies all day long. It was amazing. And I would escape the things that I was worried about. And so I'm curious, like then what kinds of things um, could you do to help survivors create similar coping and community and connections? So you wanna kind of take the advocacy skills that we talked about and kind of expand them a little. People might be typing in the chat, but I can share that from my time being an advocate. And even this morning, I um, had a conversation with somebody <clears throat> who was feeling triggered. And so one of the questions I asked them was, when you have felt this way in the past, what have you done to get through it? And I think that kind of allows for introspection for them to say like, oh, I have got, I have gotten through this before. So that's like empowering. And it also helps identify exactly. like, how do you get back to that? Exactly. That's awesome. That's a really great example, Leah. So reminding someone that they have been through this before because you lose sight of it when you're ha when you're struggling. Um, so reminding them, you know, you've done this before and you've been able to get through this. And then also, so that's one piece of it. And then the other piece of it is what was it that helped? Um, and people are, I mean, Adult survivors of child sexual abuse, at the very least, are incredibly strong people. Because if they're showing up at your program, that means they survived abuse growing up. Um, and they have been using some coping mechanisms since then that are helping them get through every day. Um, and then once, and they've been able to find your organization and they're in a position to ask for help. Those are all very, very positives. So then the question is, what skills do you have that you can use to help them cope in ways that you have found helpful? So 
Education is one of the things that was mentioned earlier. So helping people understand what can be healing, what can be grounding, what can be helpful is a really good tool to have. Um, it can be helpful to develop the skills to identify your current emotions, recognize it, name it, and take back the power over it. Yeah, that is awesome. So letting them know kind of how they can get in touch with their emotions, naming it takes the power away from it all over the place. And also you can model that. You can say to them, you know, I haven't worked with a lot of adult survivors of child sexual abuse, and I'm not sure I'm going to be as helpful as you may need, but I'm willing to try. And that takes anxiety away from kind of your, if you have any concerns, it lets them know you're trying and you might not be an expert and then you can figure it out together. Um, let's see, what else do we have? I always try and ask clients what they may already do to practice self-care and what they have done in the past and what brings them joy and then try to encourage to turn those things into what they might, uh, what might be going through a difficult time. Yes, awesome. Uh, the thing about what Leah mentioned and also what Connor's mentioning here, asking people what they've done before, what, what, are they, what helps them when they're having a hard time is really, really helpful because you're learning about that survivor. You're also building a connection with the survivor. Um, and oftentimes when an adult survivor of child sexual abuse comes to your program, it's because they don't have anyone else. To, to talk with. Um, it might be that they got triggered and they've been having a hard time for a while and they've lost a lot of people around them because when people are having a hard time and having flashbacks and struggling, they can be, um, they can self-isolate and um, lose track of their friends, um, or, or possibly be struggling and lose their jobs. So they might have lost a certain amount of support. So being someone who's trying to get to know them is really helpful. Um, and then uh, what have they done in the past? Has worked well? What interests do they have? And explore that with them. That's all really helpful. Um, identifying and recognizing what their triggers might be and helping them through emotional flashbacks. That is awesome. That is really, really awesome. So the piece there then is going to like grounding techniques. Like, so what happens to you when you get triggered? Um, and then how do you ground yourself? Making a suggestion of having them um, develop a grounding kit if they're having a hard time of things that they can keep with them, like gum that they like, essential oils that, that help to make them feel calm, stones. Um, I have an agate that I have with me because um, agates are really big in Lake Superior, which is in Duluth, Minnesota, and I love it up there. So having an agate reminds me of the beauty up there. And so a lip balm, um, lotion, all those things can um, be tools that someone has with them that helps them get grounded when they're having a hard time. Um, and then uh, I think you bring up a really good point with interest, Jeanette. I think sometimes advocates are so focused on asking the questions surrounding the assault or what they wanna do or need that we forget to build connection on a more personal level. That's an awesome point, Leah, a really good point. And so, and that is actually a big part of what, what we're getting at. Um, sometimes people don't see a hobby or activity like cooking as a self care until we ask them, how do you feel when you're making your favorite meal? Or I've heard you say in the past, like to watch movies, do you think that might help you through this? So that's awesome. Those are really great ideas. And, and that's really kind of the key here is, um, one second, I think my PowerPoint just froze. It's a really great picture to have froze on. 
quite honestly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna have to quit my PowerPoint and, uh, and then come back. There we go. And then I'll open it up again. That never happens. Um, so, and of course, without it, I can't think of what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> All right, yeah, so I know. So I wanna explore a little bit why I'm bringing this up and what's so important about this. Um, so let me go to the slide. So now I'm gonna give you just a little bit of a break in terms of having to answer questions just um, for a little bit so you can kind of chill and listen. Um, so I was 31 years old when I was diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. I was married, I had friends, I had a job um, and I was doing really well in my life or at least I thought. And I went to go see a movie that had an attempted rape scene at the beginning of it. And that was the first trigger of a series of flashbacks. Um, and I didn't know that, I didn't remember ever being sexually abused. I had really, um, I, if, if you had asked me at this age, like what, um, what my childhood was like, I would have told you that it was, I, I had a happy childhood. I just didn't remember most of it. And um, so I, I went and what happened was, is that I was sexually abused growing up and I created parts to cope with it and then, um, and to survive it. And then as an adult, I still had those parts and I didn't know that my brain worked any differently than anyone else's. And so um, I went to, I, I was referred to a therapist that I worked with for a few months and then I kept having panic attacks in my therapy sessions. So I eventually asked her to refer me to someone else and she referred me to this psychiatrist. Now, um, I worked with Rich off and on. I worked with him for five years. And then after that, I worked with him off and on for a number of years, where after five years, our work concluded. And then a few years later, new triggers came up and I needed a little bit more help. And that happened off and on for a number of years. So this book that Rich wrote that came out in 2015 is considered by a lot of clinicians the Bible of how to work with people who have dissociative identity disorder. And the reason that it's considered the Bible for working with people with DID is that Rich works with people with the intent that they will leave therapy. And a lot of clinicians weren't doing that. They just kept working with people and helping them in, in great ways. But then people would be seeing them for 20, 30, 40 years. And um, Rich in built he, his plan all along was, I'm going to work with you but I'm going to work with you to be able to do this on your own. And so the big difference between what Rich does and what other clinicians did um, is that he was constantly building connections. Um, so the, the research shows what helps people with DID is a three-phase therapeutic approach. The first phase is creating safety and stability for the person with DID. So that's dealing with things that advocates do, um, safety planning, um, crises, you know, what's going on in your life? How can I help? Um, 
like here and now stuff, developing trust, developing a relationship, being transparent. Um, that's that first stage. So you're creating rapport between the, the, per, the survivor and the clinician, and you're helping them address issues, that the, the crisis type things that brought them to you. The second stage is the trauma processing work, um, which for DID means part work, uh, parts coming forward, talking about what happened. Other people call this brain spotting, um, but basically identifying what happened and integrating the experiences of violence. That's not work that advocates do and they shouldn't do. Um, that's a clinical type of work. And then the third piece, the third phase is the phase of rehabilitation and integration. So meaning that the person feels the experiences, the traumatic experiences that they live through and separated from. So now they know these things happen to them. So they have a narrative of their lives um, that they didn't have before. And then they learn how to live their life as someone who has parts um, and, that, and, and how to live their life knowing now what happened to them. So, so that's the three phases of healing for people with DID. Okay, and, I, and I'm raising this, it's a really intricate process and the, it doesn't, it's not neat. Like there's this one phase and once you get through that phase, you move to phase two. Once you're done with phase two, you move to phase three. It's actually, you're, you're constantly going back and forth from, from, from these three phases to safety and stability. Um, so it's safe and stable. And then once you're safe and stable, you do trauma processing, which can be destabilizing. And then you go back to um, safe and stability. And then you go back to trauma processing and back to safe and stability. And then you might've had some big memories and big incident that you, that then you're integrating into your experience. You're you're realizing these things happen to you, then you go back to safe and stability. So it's, it's very fluid in that way. So the thing that Rich did that was different was he was building connections as well. He took that kind of model of how you help someone heal and you bring in to that building connections. And this is what you're doing. This is what you do when you set up support groups. This is what you do when you're making a connection with a survivor. This is what you're doing when you're asking someone, what have you done before that's helped you? This is what you're doing when you're asking people, what kinds of things do you do when you're having a hard time? Who is in your life? What's happened? These are aspects of building connections. So the way Rich did them is, and, and you're gonna find yourself in this. What Rich did was in the beginning when I was first coming in, he was building the connection between him and myself. Um, so, I'm, so I'm learning that I can trust him. I'm, I'm learning what his boundaries are. I'm learning what this process is and how he and I are gonna work together. You do this with survivors all the time. Um, and then in the next stage of trauma processing, this is not something that you would do, but just to give you an idea of how he brings connections in there, the way that someone with DID moves through the world as one after they've gone through a healing process is by having connections inside having parts that talk to each other and share information so that the person doesn't lose track of space or time. So I have parts, but I move through the world as though I'm one. And I do it because my parts all talk to each other and all get along. And so I pay attention to my thoughts, which lets me know if there's something I'm doing that a part doesn't like. And I also pay attention to my emotions and how my body physically feels, because those are other ways in which I understand how parts of me are feeling about what I'm doing or planning to do. And based on that, 
I make decisions about what I can do and what I can't do. So that's, that's that process of building connections that's so important for people who have DID. And I'm not suggesting that you do that because that's a clinical role. Then there's in the third part in the rehabilitation phase, what Rich did was he was figuring out who I had in my life and how to strengthen those connections. And if I didn't have people in my life, he was helping me try to figure out how to create community. What do I like to do? What helps me feel calm? What helps me stay present? What, um, who do I know that does things like that, that, that enjoys that same kind of stuff? Who, um, do I know anyone who, um, or, uh, so let me see if I can. So I grew up, I'm, I'm a Latina. And Rich is like, you know, do you think you want to try to get involved with um, programs that work with your cultural group? Um, I was very athletic. Do you, what are you thinking about? What do you think about joining a running club or identifying some people that you can train with to run races? Um, so he's constantly, constantly thinking about, so not just doing the work of healing, but also doing constantly working with me around connections. And then it becomes the way that my brain works because I'm working with him over a period of time. So when I say, what can you do to help people have these same things? That's really kind of what I'm talking about. So for example, um, building a relationship with a rescue group or a shelter in your area so that people who don't have animals but really would love to be around them could either foster or volunteer to walk dogs or volunteer to pet cats and clean their litter boxes at the shelter. That's a great connection and a way of helping someone create community for themselves. Um, if, if someone is athletic, thinking about what types of, of activities they enjoy and helping them find other people or clubs that are doing that in your area. And so what I'm um, recommending is building um, partnerships that will enable you to connect survivors to community that they can then take on and create themselves. So when I think about the partners that you normally work with, I think of law enforcement, prosecution, clinicians. I think you probably work with healthcare providers either as referrals, or for sexual assault uh, forensic exams. Um, I also think that you work with lawyers either that are doing protection orders or landlord tenant issues um, for sexual assault survivors. Like, uh, and then, and I'm not sure who else you're working with, um, but these are the kinds of folks that I think traditionally sexual assault advocates are working with. So then I'm wondering who could you partner with that would enable you to help survivors create connections more easily? So who are the folks in your community that you can do this with? So rescue and shelter groups to help with animals. Also, um, equine therapy is really, really great for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. So looking to see if there are any rescue groups in your area that have, um, that are connected to um, equine, uh, to horses. Um, there are different horse groups in different communities, either that rescue, there are in some communities, I know in, in my rural area of Wisconsin, we have two farms that rescue animals 
Um, and so they have dogs, they have cows, horses, pigs, chicken, everything. Um, and there are no kill. It's just, they live there. They live the rest of their lives out there. They can always use volunteers. Um, and those are incredible being animals are incredibly healing for people. So that's one place that you can start trying to reach out to and build connections with. Um, they're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for foster homes. Um, shelters are always looking for people to walk their dogs. Um, so that's one area where you might be able to build a partnership, uh, a relationship, help them understand what you do. Um, so they can refer people as well. Um, then hiking clubs. Uh, I had this, I don't have this as much in my rural area, but when I lived in the DC area, there were hiking clubs, um, and, the, and a running club that I joined. So looking for that kind, if you don't know of a, let's just say a running or biking club, um, usually you can go to a small, um, individual, a uh, small owned running store or um, a biking store, a cycling store that someone, not a, a large, not a large company owns, but a individual owns. And they will almost always have a running club or a, a riding club. Um, so that's one way to kind of reach out. Um, community gardens is a really big deal. I'm not sure if you have them there, we have them both in urban areas and in rural areas. And if you, um, you can oftentimes look them up on online or you can go to different, um, like if, if you go to a, um, a nursery, they'll often know where the community garden is in the area. Church groups, and you always wanna be careful about church and religion issues, but if you know a person is uh, very spiritual or very religious, um, that might be something that you ask questions about in terms of, um, is that something that they would find helpful? Um, so finding out what, what church groups are in your area um, would be really helpful. In my area, agricultural groups are big, like the 4-H Club or Future Farmers of America. Um, sewing groups are really popular. I mean, really kind of anything people can do together to get through the winter is popular in our area. I'm just going to say. Um, it's partly because it's rural and this is just the way people kind of get together. So there are sewing groups, there's knitting groups, there's cooking groups. Um, and book clubs. Uh, I'm part of um, an app, called, you know, that I'm sure many of you've heard of called Nextdoor app. And I see requests all the time for book clubs. Um, and then finally, other peer programs or peer support. So this is the kind of thing that you can build in your own organization is as Adult survivors of child sexual abuse have created community and have worked with your program as they've done healing. Um, are, are they willing to be a peer support for someone that comes into your program in the future? Um, would they like to volunteer at your program um, to help other folks? And peer support is a really big way to create community for people who are adult survivors of child sexual abuse. So what we know is um, like what, what Rich figured out and a lot of clinicians know is that adult survivors of child sexual abuse oftentimes uh, do not have relationships with their family because of the abuse that happened and not always that it was by their family, but because of how it disrupted the family. Um, so they oftentimes lack community. And we know that community and belonging to things is really uh, healing for folks. 
And just about every adult survivor that you talk to who has gone through some sort of healing will tell you how they created community for themselves. Um, so this is a really easy way to help adult survivors of child sexual abuse that come to your program is by helping them to create community. And if you establish relationships with organizations that do that early on, you will be able to uh, connect people much um, more quickly and easier. So, all right. Um, so my timing is almost perfect. <laughs> So I really appreciate you all um, joining in, being really active in the chat. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. If you have any questions or want more information about any of the stuff that we talked about, or you want to see more pictures of my animals. Oh my God, Leah. Your dog is so cute. Oh my God. <laughs> and oh in. my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So if you have any qu questions at all, um, please email me. And thank you so much for participating in today's session. Yeah, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, we will have another webinar with Olga next week. Let me look at the date on the 11th from 2 to 3.30. And that one is going to be on um, healthcare after abuse. So, and also specific to adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And so um, that will be another great um, discussion and presentation. So please register for that. If you can, you can register for that on our um, website. I'll also drop the link in the chat real quick for folks who have stayed on. But um, yeah, I, I echo what Olga said. Thank you so much for your participation and everybody here who has, you know, been doing this work and supporting survivors. And um, it like to Olga's point, it can be so hard in rural communities to find some of these resources. So I think using apps like Nextdoor is such a smart idea. And I was thinking about how, even if it's not an organization, if you just happen to know that this is a group that's going on, just being able to share that with survivors who you think might be interested. And that's another way to also, they can have an anonymity because they don't have to go to the sewing group and say, oh, I'm here because I'm a survivor. They can just go, but it can be healing for them. So I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thanks, Leah, totally. Um, they can just be with people. Yeah. So thanks again, everybody. Drop the link in the chat to the next webinar, and we will hopefully see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Olga. Thanks, Leah. I'm so jealous. Your dog is so cuddly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she's very sweet, but I think that's just the puppiness of her, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Enjoy I mean, it while it lasts. Exactly. <laughs> I have to take advantage. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah.